Welcome to the Straight Talk on Fleet podcast with Aaron Gilchrist. Each week, Aaron will be breaking down fleet management, trying to cut through the noise and get down to the real issues safety and operations leaders are struggling with every day. The goal will be to get to the bottom of how leaders can break down these silos of information, accelerate change management, how to use real-time accurate data to drive massive efficiencies across fleet-focused business processes, and to elevate people's careers with emerging best practices. Now it's time for the Straight Talk on Fleet. Okay, hi again, Fleet community. Um, me and my red face from a sunny weekend here in Ohio, um, filming another episode. We are episode, I think, 53 of the Straight Talk on Fleet, which is totally wild. Um, so I am Aaron Gilchrist, your host of the Straight Talk on Fleet, and I am the VP of Fleet Evangelism at IntelliShift, which is a fancy way of saying that I get to do this for a living. It's so fun. Um, I'm a longtime fleet manager. And I have a huge passion for safety and sustainability and efficiency. And what we do on the Straight Talk is we aim to bring, you know, my experience here um, to generate conversation and build community in the fleet industry um, to help other fleet ops and safe leader, safety leaders um, elevate their careers, share ideas, collaborate. So I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today, Ken Jack. Welcome, Ken. It's so great to see you. Likewise. So Ken and I have known each other a long time, um, and today we get to talk about AI, artificial intelligence. It's a hot topic. It's a big topic. It's a broad topic. But we're going to dig in a little bit and talk about what it means for us here in the fleet industry and for businesses and organizations. So hopefully today you'll leave with a sense of um, how you can better take advantage of AI in your own roles and also um, talk to folks inside your organization about how it could be a game changer for you. So so without further ado, um, I'm going to let Ken introduce himself. Ken is um, has been in the transportation and fleet industry for over 20 years, like me, um, except we haven't gotten any older. We've just been in <laughs> fleet for a long time. And, and currently, Ken is the owner and founder of Kinetic, which is a fleet and sustainable mobility management consulting firm. Um, no better job for Ken in the industry. So we love that you're here with us. So Ken, take a few minutes, introduce yourself, um, share with the audience a little bit about um, what makes you tick. Sure, sure. Thanks. And good to be here with you today, Aaron. Um, you know, I had to laugh at myself at the introduction. I Actually, November is going to be 30 years oh. in the industry. I, no, it's okay. I, okay. I had that same moment uh, earlier uh, last week. I was at a meeting and somebody was giving a presentation and they didn't know I was going to be there. And somebody said, my old boss from 20 years ago, and I quick spun around to see who was talking about. <laughs> okay, so, but for me, it's just over 20. So I'm just oh, making yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. just making yeah. that separation. <laughs> oh, kidding, like, kidding. I'm going to stop counting at 30 and just stick to, you know. I, I love it. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, my background, I, I've always loved cars. Uh, you know, my first real job, I guess, was uh, writing specifications for equipment at the utility company. Um, and my plan was to go to Detroit after I graduated engineering school. Um, and coincidentally, I had a conversation with somebody that was involved with the General Motors EV1 project. So fleet managers know about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're the ones that uh, sort of convinced me to stay at the utility. So I had a bunch of different roles in fleet logistics. I did spend some time in the uh, gas and electric side of the business as well. So very well-rounded uh, view of the utility world. And I was there for about 17 years. Uh, and then I got tapped, uh, asked to uh, kind of run the entire fleet for two of the power companies that we owned. Um, spent about 17 years there, uh, then went over to uh, one of the national telecom companies, and I ran their national fleet operation. So, you know, just uh, bigger headaches, more of everything, <laughs> more <laughs> questions, more people. Right. Uh, so that was great. Um, somewhere along the line, I went back to business school. I've served on a number of nonprofit and for-profit boards. Um, and, you know, both of those environments are where you spend a lot of time thinking about the future and how an organization prepares to be successful. But I love technology and I love trying to solve big problems. And Same. there's so many interesting things happening around AI and EVs and telematics and especially policy and regulations that are going to affect the fleet management profession. So I decided to start the consulting firm in uh, 2022. Yeah, towards the end of the year now. Congratulations. That's a, it's, it's a great spot. The industry needs, you know, more thought leaders, people with um, vast experience like you to, um, you know, 
help, you know, leaders wrap their heads around how to, not just mm-hmm. how to deal with today's problems. We know what those are. And so right. many of them are out of our control, but there's some great things we can do to not only like, you know, manage the storm or ride out the storm, but excel during this time of like hardship right. and, and change. But then think about the future, you know, and plan for what's coming down the pike the next three to five years, you know? So I think today's going to be a good conversation around that really. Yeah. A lot of exciting stuff. Yeah. I I love your story. It's so funny. Every time I talk to um, someone in sort of fleet leadership, um, it's always an interesting path to how, how we got here because no one grew up to be a fleet manager. Um, but you know, for those of you listening, it's, it's an, it's a great career and it's an awesome industry. Um, you know, in listening to you, Ken, and, and listeners can think, wow, there's a lot of different avenues that I could take, you know, as someone new to fleet, somebody could, you know, really take a lot of different, um, approaches and be exposed to different opportunities along the way. Absolutely. For sure. So let's dig into this, um, topic of AI, uh, not a buzzword, um, at all. It's here. It's now it's, it, well, it's been here mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. It, and it's not going anywhere. So, you know, when I think about AI and mach- machine learning, there's lots of different applications, but from your perspective, um, talk about it, you know, as, um, a fleet industry professional, talk to me sure. about what you've learned about AI. What is so, it? So you know, I'll take a step back first and then kind of talk about how we got to AI and then sort of like what's happening with it today. And, you know, I remember, Perfect. you know, the advent of PCs and computerized vehicles and maintenance software. I mean, those were things that were relatively sort of new to the industry, you know, when I got into it, I think. Uh, we were still used to doing uh, tracking maintenance on green screen mainframe <laughs> systems. <laughs> yes, we were. So, it's, so a lot has happened in, you know, the, the, the subsequent decade. Uh, and this is just that next evolution. So you went from sort of, you know, computer software and very, you know, basic logging of information to things that could chart and graph and give you insights. And this is just sort of that next evolution. Um, and, you know, if there's one sentence I would take away from our conversation today for folks, I think it's that you know, AI is going to be a new tool in the toolbox. And, you know, companies and individuals that know how to recognize it and know when, where, and how to use it will have some kind of advantage. We can debate, you know, how much advantage and, you know, what you want to do with that advantage and all those kinds of things. But that's kind of the takeaway. It's just one more thing. I've got a big toolbox in the garage of, you know, (laughs) tools I may or may not ever use again, but I know I have it. I know if I see the situation, I know I can go to that toolbox and pull that out and, you know, it'll help me get through that job. I I think of AI as, and there is sort of a piece of it is, you know, sort of the buzz and what's current. And then there's sort of beyond the superficial, you get into the deeper layer of why is, why are we talking about it? What happened? What changed? How Mm -hmm. did we get And I think of AI as sort of, it's like a three-legged stool and you have to have all of those pieces together in order for it to be really, uh, you know, a benefit to the fleet manager or whoever's using the AI. A piece of it is hardware. Um, And so, you know, I think back to, I think 1986 was Mercedes had their first self-driving vehicle. It was an RV. It was a 25 foot long RV with two air conditioners. And the reason it was an RV is because that's how big the computer was. (laughs) And it needed the air conditioner to keep the computers cool. So, you know, that's just, you think about scale and you say that same level of AI now probably fits on your Apple watch, right? And and better. Which is incredible, right? right? So the hardware is one leg of the stool. Then you've got the models. These are sort of the computer programs that scientists and mathematicians and folks how they've trained the computer to know how to do something, right? So I teach a computer to play chess. There's a chess model called Alpha Zero that is a, it's just a computer program for knowing how to play chess and anticipate what the opponent is going to do. And then the third leg of the stool is how you interact with the first two. And that's really where the buzz has come around lately. It's the advances in what we call generative AI, which is the ability for the computer to sort of generate and take in input. It's how it communicates with you. So I can talk to it in plain English. It knows how to convert that into something that runs on the hardware with the computer model, 
does something and then comes back and then turns it back into English to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So that third leg of the stool is what's really kind of taken off in the last couple of years. Things with that GPT and Microsoft Copilot and, you know, Google Gemini. These are just some of the names of the interfaces to those other two things. And all three legs of that stool are advancing at an incredible pace. Like I said, the hardware gets better, faster, cheaper. So you're seeing it in more places, doing more things because it becomes cost effective to do it. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about in-vehicle cameras, and we're, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about safety. You think about in-vehicle cameras or you think about ADAS systems, right? Uh, automatic driver aid you know, systems, automatic braking, those kinds of things. Those are pieces of hardware that are in the car that are running very specific computer programs that know how to recognize when I'm too close to a vehicle. It doesn't need to tell me. It doesn't need to write a sentence. It doesn't need to make a pretty picture. It just needs to hit the brakes. Right. right? So that's an example where you're sort of leaning on the first two legs of the stool. The third is not so important in that case, but it's still AI. Right. And more and more we're seeing, you know, these sorts of, uh, you know, use cases sort of slipping into different places and the ability to kind of communicate with them in plain language, that opens a whole new set of doors for what we can do with the technology, right? So, um, Especially here in fleet. So absolutely. it gets absolutely. me very, very excited. I mean, even having, having an AI video dash camera is part of our offering. Yep. IntelliShift has been really eye-opening for us and for our customers to understand what it is, but more so what it's not so that we can help with driver adoption and just clear in the air. Because I think there's a perception out there um, about cameras and other fleet technology that drivers have. So it, the, this information that's come about, there's been some great ways, and this is what I get to help customers and prospects do, is understand the technology and communicate with drivers so they understand um, that this is another tool to help them be safe, not something that's watching them. I mean, you and I know as fleet leaders, we don't have time to sit behind a computer and watch videos all day. We want event-based information to help coach drivers, even reward drivers to um, drive better, um, to have better behaviors and to change the course of their, you know, actions over time. And I think, um, you know, AI cameras are a great example of how we do that. And speaking of examples, you know, I think there's so many different sort of use cases as we think about um, AI. So, you know, what are some, we talked about one, right? We talked about AI video dash cams, but what are some use cases for um, fleet and safety leaders as it relates to AI? Yeah. Um, so again, I guess I'll, I'll kind of go back a step and say, let's think about, are we talking about use cases today? We're we talking about use cases in the future. I'll start with, you know, sort of where we are today and then what it's going to grow into, I think. Um, I don't, to your point, I don't know a fleet manager that says, you know, that they aren't being asked to do more with less, you know, improve oh, performance of the equipment, you know, have to uh, you know, it's harder to find good staff. It's, you know, you're dealing with budget constraints. So I hear a lot of folks say that they wear more hats and they don't have time to do it all. Um, oh, yeah. you and I have both been down that road of, you know, in some cases, if you run a large fleet, you've probably got more data than you know what to do with more, more than you can handle. You could spend all day reading reports and still not get to the heart of the matter. Um, so I think you gave a great example of, you know, I remember some of the old, old drive cam systems and you did literally either you had to sit there and watch the videos or somebody had to watch the videos to get to the heart of what was going on. Right. So AI kind of being able to jump in and just give you the nuggets of, you know, what should I pay attention to is a huge help. And I think that if we're talking about use cases for fleet managers, those are going to be the first kinds of use cases that we're going to see. Frankly, they're already here, you know, in, to some extent in, in different software packages and certainly more and more coming out every day. I think of fleet managers, you know, you kind of spend your time between two worlds. You've got all of your administrative functions. You're reviewing performance reports and financials and writing communications to your drivers and employees. You're doing compliance, you're giving presentations. That's sort of all the administrative, that's the business. You know, you just kind of have it's stuff that you have to do. And then there's sort of the strategic fleet management stuff. So you're actually, you know, if you have an in-source, uh, you know, maintenance operation, sort of like I did, 
you know, you're checking in on shops, you're meeting with your business partners, you're meeting with suppliers, you're evaluating products, uh, you're looking at the quality of the maintenance operation. Those are all sort of the very tactical, you know, hands-on with the customer, hands-on with the equipment itself. Right now, I would say AI is taking up more of a place in that third category, right? It's, 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 it's able to take some of the burden off of you administratively. You know, you gave the example of, you know, in-vehicle cameras, telematics, same kind of thing. It's good at pulling out what the nuggets, you know, those real nuggets of what's going on. You've got too much speeding. You've got this vehicle underutilized. Uh, you know, it, it helps point you in a direction of where you need to coach. Um, so instead of pulling out reports and, you know, creating spreadsheets and trying to sift through it all, it's just pointing you at that. Um, there are companies out there that are already offering AI tools to help you if you have commercial drivers. Uh, you know, it's helping you with your, your DOT compliance, your FMCSA, all of those sorts of things. It can go through all the driver's records and, you know, all of your events and say, this is where you're having, you might want to spend some time looking at these kinds of issues. Um, there's also a lot of good tools out there staying on the administrative track. There's a lot of really good tools out there for writing emails, doing presentation. Um, they still need your expertise. So they still need your experience to know that they're they're accurate, but if you get good at working with the tools, you'd be amazed at how much time it can save you. And I actually did a presentation for another group, and we did this live, and I, I was using one of these generative AI systems, and I said, write me a uh, reminder to my commercial drivers about their medical cards. And it gave me, you know, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. And I said, okay, this is a nice little reminder. You might put this up in the locker room, but maybe you want to say a little bit more about, you know, how to stay in compliance. So I just told the, the general of AI, I said, say more. And it just took each of those bullet points and turned it into, you know, two or three sentences. And it said things like, you know, remember to have your medical card on you. Remember to make your appointment ahead of time because your doctor may get busy and you don't want your medical card to lapse. I mean, it was, it was insightful enough to know to say that, you know, that you should plan mm -hmm. ahead to get your medical card renewed. Um, and if you're if you're a fleet manager that's wearing a lot of hats, that could be saving you a lot of time. If you have to spend a lot of time communicating with drivers, um, it is pretty shocking how well uh, some of these applications can write relevant, accurate subject material on all sorts of subjects. You still have to read through it and make sure it's right for you and customize you know, it, you know, for your unique needs, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, if you're working with an FMC or you have outsourced service providers, those folks too are starting to offer AI sort of in the package that they offer. So you log into their portal and you may have access to an AI based chatbot where you can ask about data that is part of the business that they run for you. Let's say, you know, it could be fuel cards, it could be maintenance repairs, it could be insurance, it could be a bunch of different things. And you can ask basically in plain English for, uh, you know, insightful things that help you in that engagement. Yeah. I think about, um, you know, waking up in the morning and booting up and saying, okay, how am I doing, um, on my vehicle inspection compliance today? Yeah. You know, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, think back of what we had to do to sort of take mm -hmm. a bunch of siloed data and mm -hmm. bring it in and try to make it make sense. And then, you know, graduating to some BI tools to now the, like a fleet intelligence, sort of platform like what we do where, you know, we're taking massive data sets in from all sorts of sources and, and then spitting out, Hey, here are the top five things you need to think about today, Ken, you know, um, Whoa. what are your hot spots? So uh, another neat use case was, um, you know, when I think back, you mentioned writing emails, writing memos. I mean, I remember how much time I spent, um, <clears throat> developing, rewriting, enhancing fleet policy. Um, yeah. Everything from personal use taxable benefits to, um, you know, telematics and driver safety policy to MVRs. I mean, there are a lot of facets to a um, fleet management, you know, policy or operating practices. I think about that, how quickly I could outline that today. And then again, like you said, customize it. And, and something I've done recently is um, so I shot a podcast a while back on how tough it is to switch tools and technology in your fleet. Like, so you have something, it's okay, but you know it's not going to take you to next. But 
the changing is so hard. So I, I shot a podcast on, Hey, the real pain is like staying with that subpar provider. Mm -hmm. So somebody had said, you know, I'd love your script. So I just took my, I wrote that script from here. Mm -hmm. I took that script. I dumped it into, uh, I think I used Gemini and I said, you know, can I give me, give me an outline of, of, you know, give me the high points, give me the bullets. Right. And so I was able to provide that as a consulting piece to someone, you know, I, it's like, I could take any of my transcripts from my podcasts and I could, you know, turn them into a blog because, you know, even though all of that stuff came from my intellectual property right here, you know, and talking about my experience, that transcript can be converted pretty quickly into another piece of content that I can share out with the affiliate community. So, yeah. so many, so many cool use cases um, for fleet and safety leaders. I'm excited to see um, how quickly things progress and where things go. But again, this is not, this is not new. It's just enhanced. It, we continue yeah. to find, um, you know, this continues to grow and morph. You know, you think about advanced driver assistance systems in vehicles and they've been around, that's been around a long time. Now we're able to just speed up that process and make vehicles um, even safer. And same yeah. like with the onboard technology. Think about being able to detect if somebody is drowsy, like what are the tells in yes. your face, right? And that's, that's, that's part of the advancement is that somebody kind of figured out what is the, what's the crux of what a drowsy person looks like yes. and then how do you train a computer to recognize that generically across all drivers, right? And and then it adds that layer of safety when you sort of perfect or, you know, advance that technology. Right. And being able to differentiate, you know, um, things like when a driver is wearing a ball cap or sunglasses right. and some of these things that um, right. that machine learning is that AI is helping with to, to give you just what you need to know again. So you can focus on all your million other responsibilities as a fleet leader and just yeah. get event based data that you can help um, to use, to improve driver behavior. Yeah. Um, so thinking like organizationally, um, you know, how can organizations take advantage of, um, AI? Where, where does it fit? What are some of those top categories? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it really is touching all parts of the organization. Um, and, and it's, it's sometimes it's easy to look at this as like, it's, it's IT's problem to let me know when it's time to go do it or something like that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they might be tasked with, you know, the strategy and the implementation and, you know, enabling, you know, the different parts of the, the, the organization to use these things. But it's really up to the operations, uh, supply chain, fleet, you know, safety, compliance, finance, customer service. All of those organizations are candidates for some of the capabilities that are out there. And so sometimes those capabilities may be driving somebody else. I was at a utility conference and I was looking at a... Uh, an AI system that's using cameras to identify hardware in the electrical network. So it can see a transformer, it can recognize a transformer, and it knows what a switch looks like, and it knows what bad cable looks like, or it knows what a defect in the pole looks like. So more diagnostics, so right? It, it's doing diagnostics it's amazing. in real time through vision. And so when the driver, the driver kind of drives a route, and then you get all this insight and data and it says, you know, there's a problem on pole one, two, three. It looks like, you know, the cable is not attached properly. And that's going to generate work for an operations crew to now go out and do. It's and fantastic. so the fleet needs to make sure that that truck is ready on that day when the system says, hey, I found this. So it's going to change a little bit the way that sort of, you know, that's an example of how the work, the, the work will be dispatched in a different way, you mm -hmm. know, rather than sort of, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and this is where I go, well, maybe it's more, you know, predictive or condition-based monitoring. And it's going to say, this is what we need to do. This is the highest priority because I looked at all of these different things. I think the same thing is going to happen in fleets. You know, there are already systems that are dabbling in the world of predictive fleet maintenance and mm -hmm. saying, hey, I looked at all the trucks of this make and model that are used in this region. And, you know, they all need this thing at this point in time. And so maybe instead of your maintenance schedule being a calendar based schedule, it's based on what patterns the computer is seeing in historical repair data and saying, well, you did a lot of this stuff 
in the last couple of weeks, it looks like there's a problem building up maybe of some sort. You know, and that's a little far. It's, you know, I don't know how far-fetched it is, I guess. Some days I think it is far-fetched. Other I, days I, go, oh, I see. I don't see it as far-fetched because right. <laughs> just think about, I mean, I just remember 10 years ago asking my FMC to help to, to be right. more predictive and proactive right. in terms, I mean, in all areas, but talking about maintenance, I, I remember saying, okay, can you segment my fleet all years, makes models, look at right. historical data from my fleet, but all right. the fleets you manage, look at the million vehicles that you manage as an right. organization and tell me what I need to know about my pickups. You know, if I've got 250 of this type of pickup, tell me what I'm going to run into. Help me prepare for it. Let me be able to have the right parts in stock with the vendors that I use at the right price at the right time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, it, it, we were able to do some of that just with, um, predictive analytics, but this, um, kind of takes that to the next level. And I, again, far fetched isn't a word I would use. I, I would say it's, we're, it's, a, we're on the cusp, which yes. it gets me excited. I'm like, yeah. you know, today I get to be a fleet manager really without a fleet, which is a lot less stressful. But tools like this get me excited for fleet managers to be able to focus on more strategic things and start to um, really help their organization see them as a profit generator versus a cost center, you know? Totally. totally. Yeah. And it's you know, tools like this that'll help to do that. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. so that information. fun to think about. You know, I think for some, it seems a little scary. Like, you know, what does this mean? Um, how How is all this information out there? Well, it's out there. All of us have contributed something into this network um, that we're able to, you know, derive information from. Um, what are, on that note, what are some risks? Are there risks from your point of view? Yeah, yeah, there's a few. Um, you know, nothing is nothing is ever free, so there's always stuff to think <laughs> about. And I think it goes back to that question about, like, where in the organization, like, who's sort of getting it started, who may be a stakeholder, who's going to make decisions about it. Um, so when I think about the risks, there's a couple things. There's... The first thing I'm a little bit worried about is sort of, you know, questionable marketing of everything as something or other AI. And the question will be, what does it really do? How is it better? What's the cost versus what it's going to save you? How are you going to leverage what it's able to do? So I think it's going to change for, you know, the fleet manager or maybe your procurement folks or your IT folks. If you're thinking about a new system or changing providers or suppliers, if you have some outsourced services, when they put that in the bid, they have AI. You're going to have to ask intelligent questions about, okay, so what does that get me? How the value proposition. What's the value proposition? Yeah, show, me, sure. show me how good it is and why it's good for me and show me how it's different than what everybody else might offer me. So they'll, they'll be that. Functional use cases, right? Yeah. 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 Um, good point. It, it, I, I say it's magic, but it isn't magic. <laughs> right? It doesn't solve every problem. And so there is sort of, there's still the culture, the training, uh, the tough conversations about what a fleet needs versus what it expects and what it's set up to deliver, right? So AI isn't going to magically fix. If you have other structural issues, you know, that you're wrestling with with your leadership, this might give you some data to help make the case. But in and of itself, it doesn't just solve everything and make everything. It's not going to change your safety culture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> If, if you're not funding your life cycle or you're not, you know, monitoring your driver qualifications or other things like that, this is just going to tell you that it's broken. It's not going to fix it. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so there's that. Um, one of the big areas that folks are talking about is security, ethics, and copyright. And this gets a little bit sort of abstract and ethereal, but, you know, it's it, it can be tempting to use some of the free tools that are out there. There's lots of different, you know, ways to kind of get your feet wet and start using it. Um, and, and while folks may be using this well-intended, there's always the risk that the company loses control of its data. Somebody decides that, it, you know, they were trying to do an experiment and they wanted to see if AI could solve this, that, or the other thing. And you inadvertently sort of move data from inside the company out into a public platform. Yikes. Um, big players have lots of rules around what they do with it. And so you're probably, you know... I, I'll put a big disclaimer at the end of this. Like, you know, you're probably safe with a lot of the big providers that they've already thought about that and they realize 
people are coming to their platform and asking questions and maybe cutting and pasting data that they shouldn't. Um, but you don't always know. And I think it's, it's worth having those conversations with your IT people, your legal people, your sourcing people to think about these kinds of questions as you're embarking on. Right. So it's one thing if you want to do a little bit of a sandbox and try something, if you're really moving toward, hey, I want to go wide scale in my enterprise. I want to put in a new maintenance system and I want a maintenance system that has AI capabilities. You're going to have to ask questions about. How is the data safeguarded? Does the data get fed into other models? You don't want to provide proprietary information that then somebody else somewhere else is asking AI a question and it's using your information to answer their question. That, oh, you don't want that. 100%. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's that. The, the big, I think, risk is, you know, inaction or not having a plan at all. It's tempting to say, I'm going to wait until this AI thing throws itself up. This sounds really confusing. But I think, you know, as you said, it is inevitable. It's already here. It's it's only getting better, which means that it's time now to start doing that pre-work. Th those yeah. things that you need to figure out what's going to happen with your company policy, your training, your readiness, thinking about what data you have and what problems you want to solve, cleaning up data. You know, I've I've done work with companies where they had one system, but everybody was using that system differently and calling different things different things. And if you then want to go and use AI to try to sift through that data and find things, well, it doesn't help if I have seven people calling at seven different things. It's hard to kind of get the insight that you want. Um, so you have to have a long-term plan for what is your what is your company's roadmap look like for adopting AI? Where and when? Who will be involved? What things need to be addressed before we even start picking out software? you know, kind of getting the basics down because you still have to do the basics as a fleet manager and do them well. Um, and then the last one is the results. You know, what will uh, what will it cost versus what will the benefit be? We have to have an agreement. We probably want to have an agreement up front to say, if you're going to your boss and saying, hey, I want to do this, you know, they're asking for something in return. They want to know what it's going to look like. Show me what will be better. Tell me exactly what will be better. How will we know? How will we agree? Um, on, on how we capture and quantify the benefits. Um, if AI tells me to put more parts on the shelf, it only matters if, you know, it, it makes a difference whether I'm being managed, measured on how much inventory I hold versus business outcomes like fleet availability, right? So if I want the trucks to be available and spending a little bit more on the parts to have the right part on the shelf so I don't have to wait for the repair, that might make sense. But you're going to have to have those conversations with all the leadership teams to say what does, you know, how do we define success? Yeah, I mean, gr great summary of the risks and really diving into, again, additional use cases and, you know, things that advice for organizations who are thinking about this. While it seems fundamental, it's really like, yeah, let's start having these conversations and socialize within the organization. One, who's using it today? How's it being used? But then really putting in some safeguards um, yeah. to make sure that everybody understands um what happens when you, it's ex externally shared data. It's kind of scary, but all, but I think what's, I mean, think about all the things that we've had to think about it over the years and data security has been a hot topic for a really long time and will always be a hot topic. And this is just, again, you, like you said, another tool that if we're going to use it, we got to make sure that we protect ourselves. Um, because in the end, um, it will make us more efficient. I think about so many cool things like budget and forecast. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I remember the time that we spent, you know, working together with finance and trying to, you know, put together um, the most precise fleet budget and considering everything, right? Looking at historical data, looking at what we're doing today, thinking about how things are changing in the next year or so and trying to really nail down our spend, um, an AI tool could really help to do that in a much quicker time frame and and likely more accurately. So great great use use cases, but definitely some risks and planning involved as we as we yeah. go forward with this. So thinking about just the role of a fleet manager specifically, like what we do every day, and you and I have spent lots of time in that chair. Think about you know how AI might affect. Um, that role of the fleet manager, what, what's your perspective? Yeah, 
you know, I think it, it, it's definitely going to change the balance in terms of what a fleet manager spends their time on. And I think, again, I think back to, you know, when I got Lotus one, two, three, that was a big deal. <laughs> and, you know, I was the guy to go to and, okay, well, we're going to crunch some data. We're going to do, you know, next year's budget, you know, forecasting and stuff like that. And you went to the person who had the tools and knew how to use the tool. And AI is going to sort of be that next evolution. So it's going to change who you go to. The people who know how to use it are, you know, are going to get asked to get involved in different kinds of things. I think it'll also sort of change what we think of as the special sauce. You know, what is the fleet manager? Um, and I, I used to, you know, challenge my teams to kind of think about this as we were making personnel decisions. Is the best manager somebody who had been a shop supervisor or had been a mechanic? And, and you know, what other things, you know, what other skills do you need to sort of be good at the job, so to speak? And I think this will be something that will add to it, right? So all those things that we learn from, uh, you know, experiences, those things that, you know, you and I say, oh, I, I have a gut, I can look at the data and I know in my gut, this is the issue that they're, you know, gonna have to answer. Or if you have technical knowledge of how to do something, if you, you know, maintain very specialized kinds of equipment, you know, sort of, those are things that we have leaned into, you know, for decades and sort of, it's those things and then everything else. Um, I don't think those that body of knowledge is going to be obsolete overnight. But as you think about the ability, like I said, you know, my example of asking it to write a compliance memo, it was surprisingly accurate at the amount of stuff it knew about what compliance meant. And it, there weren't a lot of errors in it, you know, so it understood. And you say, well, if that's true, then what do I do as, you know, my, what was my day to day like? Like you said, you came in, you logged into a bunch of systems, you looked for reports on things that were exception issues. You looked at some things that were forward forecasts. If all of those things are sort of a click or an inquiry away, okay, well, what do you spend the rest of your time on? How do you make a difference in your organization? And I would say, you know, knowing how and when to use the tools, what it means to your business, knowing how to lead people, all of those things aren't going away. Right. right. You still have to do those things and you got to be really good. And now there's no excuse that I was busy doing something else. And I wrestled with this a lot, too, is, you know, you only had so many hours in a day and people will index towards the thing that they're most comfortable with. They'll spend the most time on. And they'll go down all the rabbit holes and somebody else is comfortable with something different. So they go down different rabbit holes because they're good at finding the information about those things. This kind of bubbles it all to the surface to say, hey, we're all playing with the same information. We all saw the same insights about how the operation has been running. How are you going to fix it? Right. And kind of that people leadership, I think, is going to become more important because you have more time to do it. It'll be more important that you know how to use these AI tools because saying I'm going to take a couple of days to go work on a spreadsheet really will be sort of the, that will be out. Today it's the norm. Tomorrow it'll be outside <laughs> the norm. And you're getting that information and move on. Let's stop. You know, you're not spending two days working on a spreadsheet. You got no excuse. Let's go get stuff done. You yeah. Know? Um, so I think that's going to be the big change. I mean, that's that's beautiful. I, I For me, when yeah. I hear that, it's music to my ears. I think about all the time that I spent doing things that were oh, mission yeah. critical, but I wanted to be influencing, right? Yeah. I wanted to be driving safety culture. I wanted to be having conversations with my C-suite about what it truly means to have a safety culture and then how we get there. You know, I think that it will allow fleet managers more time to be collaborators and influencers inside their organization, inside their industry, inside their trade. If some of these administrative things can be streamlined. Absolutely. And to me, that's really good news. It might sound scary to some, um, but again, uh, your point to how, how we use it to be efficient and effective. And then think about what you can do with the time you have. Um, and again, t to me that the opportunities are sort of, you know, endless. I, I have found through my sort of inside and outside consulting and my role, um, there's a surprising number of organizations that think they um, are safety culture sort of driven and, and they're not, they're really focused. You know, I think we've done a lot of work and with utility and electric and these organizations are mission critical focus on the tools and equipment and 
the um, technicians and the operators being really safe, personal protective equipment, the, the health of the equipment itself, but they don't take that safety sort of culture and take it into the cab of the mm-hmm. vehicle. Mm-hmm. And that is a shocking differentiator in my mind. Like, you know, you think everything they do is focused on the site and the zone and the, and the operator's safety every day. But I'm like, how did they even get there? They went out on the roadways with a hundred thousand other complete lunatics who are doing everything but driving right. behind the wheel. You right. put, it's like, it's a war zone. Yeah. It's a war zone. And you, you put them out there on the road with no safety tech. They can disable what's in the asset. They don't have any onboard technology um, that helps predict what's happening out around them, but then also, you know, wakes them up if they're falling asleep or, so I think that, you know, um, fleet managers having extra time to focus on driving that sort of culture, like the way we work type of thing in their organizations will be a game changer. Um, they'll have more time to do that, you know, with use of with AI and machine learning, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say similarly, you know, we were doing some work in uh, one of my roles around training and looking at it's interesting when you look at what subject knowledge, you know, one of our technicians knew, there's what they know and there's what they think they know. Mm-hmm. And, and and I don't mean that to be dismissive, but, you right, know, right. It, was, it was interesting sometimes how fun, sometimes people were confidently wrong. <laughs> you know, they were, they were hundred percent sure this is the answer. Other Been people there. would say, you know, I'm not <laughs> sure if it's A or B. Other people would say it's absolutely B. And you say, are you hundred percent sure? Absolutely. No, the answer is C. And we were able to use that to start sort of divining, like how to deliver the training, what training to deliver. And we were just getting started. And I think this is the other opportunity for AI down the road is you're going to start seeing AIs from different worlds sort of work with each other, right? So we had one AI that's looking at training and sort of your, your knowledge score and your confidence in your knowledge score. And we were looking at, can we connect that to the performance of the repair itself? So if somebody is confidently wrong, they're following the wrong procedure to fix something, and I'm wondering why I have repeat work in the shop, there's a relationship between those two things. And yeah. fixing the training or putting that person through some coaching or whatever the case may be can have worlds of impact on the bottom line. So it's it's training, it's not getting hurt, but then there's also sort of a business outcome, dollars and cents, uh, you know, from sort of connecting the dots and saying, I have to do something different. I have to, I have to, you know, reevaluate. hundred percent. I, I feel like we could be here literally all day talking about all the different <laughs> I, ways we could. I can go on about this. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's so fun. I, I love it. And I think we're, we're brazing the surface here folks today, but certainly, um, you know, if you, if you want to learn more, Ken and I are both here. Um, you can find both of us on LinkedIn and, and definitely, um, you know, find the podcast wherever you enjoy listening or watching good content. But um, one last question I want to ask here, Ken, um, unrelated to this awesome topic of AI and machine learning, Mm -hmm. or or maybe related, um, but you've been in the industry, as you said, a long time. I think we landed on 30 years. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What advice would you give a new fleet leader coming into the industry right now? Broad question, but I, yeah, 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 it's a good uh, one. You know, I, I, th- there's a quote, uh, Thomas Paine, one of our founding fathers said, lead, follow, or get out of the way. <laughs> and I think George Patton reused it uh, somewhere down the road. He also, sure did. <laughs> the way. But I mean, there's, there's, there's some truth to it, right? It's as the world is changing, whether it's AI or, you know, what it means to be a fleet manager or taking advantage of just sort of what, how the world is changing. You can either choose to lead through that. Um, you can choose to be a good follower. There's nothing wrong with being a good follower sometimes. Um, but get out of the way of both of those people because <laughs> otherwise you're just holding things up. There's a great scene in, uh, there's, there's a movie about sort of about AI and robots and how the AI comes to learn, you know, what it means to be human, what it means to be part of a society. And towards the end, the AI 
steps up and becomes a leader of the other AIs, which is it's a little bit bizarre and maybe it's a little bit scary, but it was it was a very wholesome moment to think that leadership will be redefined over time. Yeah. You know? So I think whether it's AI or anything else, reach out, get advice on how you can be informed about whatever is changing. Like I said, if it's policy issues, if it's things to do with electric vehicles, I think AI is going to have a lot of application in terms of how we adopt EVs, uh, you know, into fleets. But all of these things, no career stays stagnant. Assume that these things are going to change in the span of your career, unless you're retiring in the next year. <laughs> you know, you have to assume that these things are going to change in the time that you'll be in that field. And do you want to be part of the movement and, you know, be able to contribute to the conversation about how to incorporate those things or are you kind of stuck on the sidelines because you can't you can't converse um about the things that are happening you know in your industry yeah that is fantastic advice so um again ken love to spend time with you today always love seeing you um fleet community out there great stuff um to think about and to take to heart from today's conversation um, I'm excited to to get this out and and I and I love to post clips. So we'll share some great nuggets out here um, from the episode. But for all of you um, out there, thank you for supporting the Straight Talk on Fleet. Um, we'd love to hear your questions and hear what you're doing, what's working, what's not working. Um, so you know, message me, message Ken, like or comment or subscribe wherever you find your content. But As we always say on Straight Talk on Fleet, keep it real, keep it safe for fleet's sake. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Ken.